Well, I stopped by on Friday. Now you guys have been through this for four days, so hopefully you know, you've learned a lot. So what are some of the things you've learned so far? Some really awesome tools. Really awesome tools. Really awesome tools. And the new techniques that I've learned from this class is really going to be beneficial to uh, other people, to myself, and they get really good results. What are some of these techniques? Um, well, there's listening, um, communication, um, skills that um, you either have had before or they're brand new. Um, just to be focused on and be present with the client. And there's a whole bunch of um, questions and it's the this, um, this, this series of the questions and how they're presented to the to the client. So this is just a lot. I'd add a little bit to that, so and that, sure. uh, you know, for me, in, the, in, the, in the, the work that I do, a lot of it is referred to as self-help. And in uh, kind of reviewing this whole uh, concept, it seems to me to be, uh, give a whole new meaning to the terminology self-help, in that what you're doing is, uh, the practitioner is really just um, a facilitator. In, in every sense of the word, just um, just there to give some order to the uh, opportunity of the person to really help themselves find what it is that uh, is the core of the issue that they're trying to deal with and look within themselves to find um, the opportunity to um, release that uh, that incident from the influence it has on their life. And, and so, uh, to me, it, it really represents the purest form of self-help. Okay, we talked about what you guys have learned. Uh, I'd imagine that probably all of you are going to find this helpful going forward. Probably wouldn't be taking the class if it wasn't, but it's probably a year the end this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you? Can I? Oh. Uh, you go ahead, and then I'll say. I was just going to say that I'm learning what it means to be predictable and to stay safe with the tools that are offered in TIR. Why don't you elaborate just a little bit, Donna? How, how did you learn, what did you learn about, in a nutshell, we don't want to go on too long about safety, but what are two or three things around safety that you learned that you didn't know before you came? Well, the idea of how to set up um, um, a session and so that the person that you're, the, the viewer is very comfortable and therefore they're, they're comfortable because you're very predictable in the questions that you ask okay. and what you're what they're expected of or what is expected of them yeah, that's great thank you I'm just wondering, you, for you guys, if you have any thoughts of how you might use this when you leave. Like, cause some people just use it with their friends and family just very slightly, and other people use it full-blown, completely in their work that they do. So um, we don't have to go around the room or anything, but if two or three of you want to just mention where you see this might be applicable in your life, just to let Stu know that. 
maybe in a way that you hadn't thought of before you came in. Because I know those of you that work in agencies probably, predictably, thought, well, I could probably help my clients in my agency. So why don't you mention something that might be, um, that kind of surprised you that you might be able to, a different way that you might be able to use what you've learned. Say something. Yeah, and just speak up a little bit. Um, I'm used to dealing with people with a lot of trauma, and I use this specific technique, and this has given me um, a new approach to help people um, process their trauma. Um, I thought the unblocking technique was going to be really helpful. I had clients in mind as I was listening. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm anxious to get back to work and see how I do. I'm sorry, what's the unblocking technique? Well, um, if, if somebody comes in with um, an issue, say they have issues in their marriage, there's a series of questions that you go down through and you help the person uncover any um, content say if anything's being suppressed or and if there's a mistake. Uh, there's a whole series of questions that helps that person investigate um, that issue. They come to a different understanding through their own process. Okay. Yeah. That and all sense. I do is ask the question and listen. And that gets built. Acknowledge. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things I think is really, really important in this, and it was for me when, when I started as a client, is that when I'm talking to the facilitator, and my facilitator also happened to be a therapist, even though we, all, we have a few therapists in here and then mostly lay people, what I, thought, what I found very powerful and very empowering was that I'm saying exactly what the problem is in my words. Um, you know, like, for instance, if I'm saying I have marriage problems, no one's saying, well, is there abuse? Or, you know, no one's saying anything. They're just quiet. And I get to elaborate myself. No one is leading, there's no leading questions at all. And so every word that comes up about the problem is my word. It's nobody else's. No one else's interpretation or... No one else is rephrasing, um, and ma because in rephrasing, you could traumatize someone. Um, so I only heard my own words talking about the problem, and like with the just one technique called unblocking, that list of questions that Barbara referred to, all Barbara's doing is asking the questions. If I come in the next week and I want to talk about my job, she can start at the very same list of questions, and I am going to answer those based on my, you know, concerning my job. And again, the only words I'm going to hear about my job are mine. She's not going to say, well, you know, you must be getting really sick of that, you know. I mean, she's not going to say anything. She's not going to comment. Um, and where the power, I think, really, really comes in. The first part, I just want to say that's really about safety you're not the person feels safe because you haven't thrown in some word that they don't even you know anyway so let's go over to on the other the solution as she keeps asking the questions and I have some realizations and then I I get an insight about something as she's just asking the question and then finally I come to a conclusion of oh well maybe I could do this instead of that. I'd only seen it this way, but now I see that I have actually three choices. I could do this or this or this. I might leave that session not knowing if I'm going to do A, B, or C, that session, but at least I'm feeling empowered where before I was feeling trapped and vi victimized. And the thing is, I'm walking out of there not with Barbara saying, well, why don't you go try A, and if that doesn't work, try B, and if that doesn't work, try C. Because if I did any of those and it was her suggestion and not right for me, that could also be a big problem. So the words that I use as a client, I will hear those over and over in my head. I'm not going to hear you know, her saying, oh my God, I can't believe that, or whatever. I mean, you're only going to hear your own words when you're talking about the problem or the solution. 
The facilitator only facilitates. And I, I do want to just qualify by saying there's one exception to that, and that is if the facilitator needs, say someone comes to me and, um, you know, they've been at a job for a long time, they're doing a great job at it, but they really, um, they have some passion that they've always wanted to do, you know, instead of, you know, being a newspaper reporter, which, you know, they've been doing it for 20 years, they've always wanted to open a coffee shop, you know, and, you know, but they don't know if they'll make any money, blah, 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 so, um, but they don't even have a clue where to begin. They're just like, I just don't know where to begin. Well, if they're sitting there staring at me and saying, I don't know where to begin, and they really don't know where to begin, which some people just really don't, if you wait a few minutes, not a few minutes, but if you have some silence there and they do have some ideas, you want it to be their ideas first. But if you really didn't know where to begin, I might say, as a facilitator, why don't I take off my facilitator hat for a moment and I'll put on my consultant hat and maybe we could brainstorm about some things that you might do to things that you might think about if you want to start a business. I might tell you about incubators without walls. You might want to set up a meeting with Jim at Penquist. Um, I mean, I might tell you some things I know, but I would probably, in that situation, say, you know, if you set up something with Jim, he could probably give you a whole lot of ideas. And doesn't mean you'll ever start a business, but you might at least go to see someone you didn't know about Jim. I mean, I don't, that's impossible in Skaggs County. <laughs> um, everyone knows about Jim. But if you just moved here, you don't know about Jim. And then I'd say, well, how does that seem? Do you want to continue talking about job stuff, or do you want to move on to something else, or are you done for the day? And you might say, no, I'm done with job. Now I just want to tell you about this pain I'm having in my foot. So I say, okay, well, hold on just a second. Take my, facilitate, uh, my, my consultant hat off, put my facilitator hat back on, and say, okay, tell me about that. Do you see how we switch gears? Yeah. But really, I, ha I don't wear my facilitator hat hardly ever. Do you, Cheryl? I mean, I'm sorry, consultant, consultant hat? Mm, no, not, yeah. not often. Yeah, because most people, if given the opportunity to just really start looking at something, like it, say it is someone that lives in this community, they might say, well, you know, I keep seeing that incubators without walls. And would I ne then need to go into consultant mode? If they say, you know, I know that Jim does this thing all the time, maybe I should give him a call. So then I don't need to put my hat on because I know Jim can help him. I, they don't need me anymore. It might, consultant hat might be to help someone role play asking a girl on a date if they're really shy and they just have never asked anyone and they, they're really nervous. So we could role play, for instance. I wouldn't just say, well, do your best and let me know how it goes and if you get traumatized, we can do a session. You know, so it's, it, that's the only time they're going to hear my words is when I have a consultant hat on. Mine coming from me versus the protocols of TIR and, yeah, good. Questions, comments? One thing I wanted to, to say is that when Aaron and I used to do the Evergreen training. A lot of times people when would say, you know, would meet people like you who care about people and would say, um, gee, Russell, you've got such a caring, you know, kind heart. You would be a perfect candidate, if you're interested, to be a facilitator for that bereavement program. And sometimes when we suggest that to people, they're just like, I couldn't take all the crying. Well, they, who told them there's any crying? They made it up. Yes, there could be crying, but they're making it up that every week there's an hour of crying. Do you see what I mean? So people have preconceived ideas about what the Evergreen training is so they don't take it, and then Evergreen has a hard time getting volunteers for their program, and the program can be in jeopardy if there's not enough people to volunteer because of their preconceived ideas, where you guys, I know, would all have a blast at Evergreen. So people also have a lot of preconceived ideas about when they see traumatic incident reduction workshop, you know, November 8th to 11th, you know, I don't have a flood of phone calls. So, and, and I'm sure that that's because people have preconceived ideas. It's like, oh, I could never do that. I could never, or, and, then they don't, and they don't even know what it means. So I just would like you guys, you know, to, to respond a little bit to, was, was being here really heavy for you and was it really traumatic for you? And I'm only saying that because with bereavement, people think it's all about crying. So was this, 
I just want to know, like, what, if you were to tell someone about the workshop, what would you say? You're not dealing with straight classic trauma. It's whatever the person you're talking with perceives as a traumatic incident. What may be traumatic to Barbara may not be to me. So it's all about what you feel. Carrie's upset she dropped her toothpaste this morning. Mm -hmm. And she wants to process that. So it's really, I think sometimes the term mm -hmm. throws people off, mm -hmm. but it's really <clears throat> those perceptions and understanding really what the process is mm -hmm. and that it can be used in every situation everything that you know happens it's if something that you need you want to process how you're feeling and how it's affected you good see I just comment on that until I realized that it was like that I was very anxious wondering what the next thing was going to be and then when we you know came to the realization it's my perception of something is going to be different than hers. I was fine and it's it done. But that first few, you know, hours maybe in class, I'm thinking, oh, this might not be where I want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of in its simplest um, forms, it's 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 almost like the analogy of the of the kid that um, you know gets hurt on the on the field of play and. You know, is running to the sidelines crying, and the, and the parent or the coach is is telling the kid to suck it up and and uh, play through it. And the kid doesn't have an outlet to 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 play out that that experience of pain that he's trying to work through. So he stuffs it down and sucks it up as he's been told, and um, you know maybe maybe later on after you know, sucking it up a hundred times in a hundred different situations uh, develops an attitude over something that may um, represent a hurdle for him in some other element of his life. And, uh, you know, because of the way we are and the way we don't take the time to, to you know, process that sort of stuff with each other, it never really does get the opportunity. Right. And here's, here's, a, here's a tool that, um, you know, with, with with some training and some experience, somebody could uh, work with this person, and it's really totally non-intrusive. Um, the person, the facilitator, doesn't give any advice, doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do, doesn't tell you to suck it up, or doesn't tell you to spit it out. You know, it it's just doesn't tell you to let it go. Just lets you do what you got to do to deal with it in the way that you could have dealt with it in the beginning if somebody would have just given you the opportunity to deal with it. Yeah. And so I think it just lets you finish it out, mm -hmm. even though you might be finishing it out years later. Mm -hmm. um, once it's done, you can get rid of it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't bother you anymore. And that's the way I'm, that's the way I'm uh, looking at it. That's, that's my takeaway, is that you know, a lot of the work I do is, that can be considered dark and sinister, but um, there's also another side of it that a lot of the people's concerns after their crisis needs are met. A lot of this stuff has been triggered by the incident of crisis. Now they, now it's complicated by all the little sucks, you know, suck it up kind of things that happened in their life that are clouding their ability to move on. So they, even though they es escaped, a, you know, an abusive relationship. And they've been assisted to get, you know, uh, out of that relationship to a safe place. There's all this other stuff that really doesn't have so much to do with the abuse as it does what the abuse triggered and the avalanche of stuff that they might have to unclog so that they can just move on and be successful. And the same in, in what I do, suicide prevention. I mean, I have people that come to me in trauma all the time. So I've been doing this for about two and a half years now and have had good results with the clients that I've had. Um, and now this is my first step to becoming a trainer. So you can get out there and, and give these tools to other people and, and get as many people as we can get help that they need. 
And I think just on a lighter note, my experience with TIR is that I was a viewer. I, I've been in session prior to coming to this training, and I used it for just a lot of miscellaneous life issues that I wanted to take a look at and sort out and figure out. So it doesn't necessarily have to be trauma in the traditional sense that mm. we think of something devastated. It can just have to do with anything that's causing areas of our life to feel unmanageable or to not feel totally comfortable with. And yeah. Stu, just so you know, this this is one of three workshops. Um, this. And they can be done in different order, but this one right here is the TIR workshop. It's four days, it's 28 hours. Um, another one that people can take first if they want to, that's just, it just as means you're starting on a different foot. You still gotta walk, you still gotta move both feet if you're gonna walk. But um, the other one is life stress reduction. And that has a lot of tools that, that actually you could, you could give some of these tools to two five-year-olds and, and they could have a fun time with them. Um, we have a third workshop called TIR Expanded Applications, and it just, I mean, there, we're always coming up with new things to add to these programs, but, you know, it might, it, that one's got like a, you know, a, what, addictions program in there and some other things. So, body image. yeah, body image program. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, the TIR and the LSR workshops really handle a lot of stuff, and I highly recommend that if you're going to be a facilitator, Take them all. I mean, that way you're not walking away with, without enough tools in your box. But people, everyone that leaves here today can leave and, and get good results if they never take another one of these workshops. So long as they follow the protocol that they've been taught, which is like what Art said, you're not going to be giving advice and all that. So long as you follow the rules. Um, would love to have you take the training sometime. Oh. Um, one thing I want to ask and, and have you guys respond to is, I've been to a lot of um, conferences before that are four days, and it's just, it's horrible. It's four days, and you're sitting in a room, and it's horrible. You, you have to go because your job is sending you, and they're, but it's horrible. You can't wait to just get out of there. So this is four days, and, and this, this right now, this, this chat we're having is at the end of the fourth day. So I just want you to comment a little bit about whether or not this training has just whatever it's whatever you want to say about it because um, again people have preconceived ideas about well I don't want to spend four days you know hearing all this horrible stuff about trauma it has not been horrible <laughs> it's been very informative it's been fun um, it's been great I really need to see it come to an end that's why we have two more and I'm so <laughs> glad that it was local yep yeah. because eight hours being attentive um, these skills, what we've witnessed through some of the videos, some of it's been really heavy. And mm -hmm. I like having all four days together. I did too. Instead of, you know, maybe a week in between mm -hmm. each one, not that you're going to lose what you've right. got, but it's so fresh if you just mm -hmm. keep going and going and going right. and practice right, right over itself. Just and keep going. that experiential pieces that we're actually practicing what we're learning. We're not just mm -hmm. watching videos and reading. We're mm -hmm. practicing. Yeah. Well, you're seeing it work from the facilitators point of view, you're going, wow, I can't believe that I did that, and I really didn't even hardly do anything. Right. Or you're sitting in the other seat going, I can't believe, I thought this, this issue was going to be, it's going to take me six months to get over, and I just got over it in six minutes. How did that happen? Yeah. yeah. What about other people's reactions to four days of sitting in a conference room? It went really fast. Mm -hmm. um, from the beginning, you know, there's an introduction, and then you have you know, the training manual, we saw some really interesting, you know, videos, and then to actually go from viewing a, an actual session to actually going in and applying that mm -hmm. and feeling how that worked, yep. and we would change roles. Mm -hmm. There would be, you would be a facilitator, and then you would change and be a viewer, mm -hmm. and that was really very productive and some of the results were quick really quick you know you you were in a safe you really felt that you were in a safe environment and you had a topic and the facilitator held the group and there was nothing that was not known mm -hmm. 
um, as the facilitator instructed the viewer exactly what was going to happen in the ses session. So you knew right up front that this was the format, nothing else was going to change, and that any time if the viewer felt uncomfortable with the feelings or emotions, that they could stop. And so the whole experience was safe, and the results were like, wow, wow. And I think everyone here had at some point a wow experience with this TIR. Mm -hmm. Good. I am. Um, I've been to a lot of um, conferences myself. Uh, you know, when you look at it on the on on the paper, you know, nine to five, you know, you know there's going to be a lunch break. Um, but this was one of those nine to five experiences where there was no uh, no desire to be a clock watcher. There was always something that was like interesting. Um, it, it's it's not like you looked forward to the end of every anything, but rather the you know the initiation into into the next you know next uh, opportunity that was going to be in the next chapter, and it just seemed like you know and. and and it was good chemistry among all the people in the room too. Um, that everybody is uh, really interested in learning, but uh, it's not just the content; it's the delivery as well. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, Cynthia is a fun, um, you know, presenter, and um, you know, it, it was it was it was easy to use. Uh, analogies that were, you know, it was easy to be able to explain some of the concepts because the concepts themselves are pretty um, elemental uh, to human beings, you know, I mean, we maybe we've forgotten how to be the type of listeners that this kind of uh, reminds us that we're supposed to be mm -hmm. yeah. and that if we apply just the essences of the, of the listening uh, exercises, some of the other exercises, will 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 in fact be better communicators with the people we live with, not just the people that we might be working with, and uh, you know will you know in a way in a way it'll create a, a, a better safer um, home, it'll create better safer societies just because. Um, just because of the ripple effect of, of, of the way in which we interact with other people, just haven't had the experience of, of um, being reminded of, of something that we probably knew when we lived in caves. And I'd, I'd like to jump on the back of that, too, because for me, I think I came into it to learn new skills that I might be able to apply in a more professional setting. But surprise for me is that it's so applicable to everyday life and I think that it's something that I'm going to be much more cognizant of everyday conversations that I have with people of how to be a better listener um, there are a lot of people for a variety of reasons who are experiencing a lot of trauma and other significant critical incidents in our society. And maybe it's a sign of the times we live in or just whatever. But just to be there for people who need to express what's going on for them can be huge in that person's life. And you're never really going to know sometimes whether you know you made a difference or or what the impact of your listening to them actually was. But it, it's not going to hurt. This is truly a do no harm mm -hmm. type of um, yeah. program. Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel that it's, it's something that can benefit anyone, anywhere, anytime. As long as they approach it with the understanding that they need to set safe, appropriate boundaries, follow the protocol, anyone can do it. It does not require special skills, it just requires a due diligence with the program. 
can't you see bed and breakfast across the United States? <laughs> yeah, yeah, bed and breakfast. Yes, and in Maui. <laughs> yeah, and in Maui. Um, we're going to need to be getting back to our training in about five minutes, so we've got to wrap this up. Um, but just so you all know, what we're doing right now in front of Stu is what we would have done at the very end of the day. So we're not, I just want you to know, because we do want people to have a chance to debrief if they have questions, if they have something they're still questioning about, they're not sure about. So we're, we're going to still do a little bit more of that on the technical side at the end of the day. But I wanted you guys to know that this piece about just kind of popcorn sharing about insights was going to happen anyway. Um, there's one thing that, um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot more things actually that, that we could talk to you about and that I'd love to get on video. Um, but one thing I just would like to have, a, anyone can say anything about this, it doesn't matter who, it, who responds. Um, I'm a lay person and I'm doing this and Lynn just answered that question, anyone can do this. But would someone speak to, um, you know, there are certain professions that may not feel comfortable. Why would they sign up for a training with me? I don't have any initials after my name. Actually, I do. But they're all related to this. I, I don't have a master's in social work. I'm, I'm not a PhD. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, what, you know, I'm not a university professor. Why would I think the School of Social Work should even take a look at this? So just, I'm not looking for a long answer, but just, you know, reactions about me as a, as a trainer and being a layperson. Uh, I'll answer that as, as easy as I can because it, I can, it resonates with me because I don't have initials after my name either. And I train others uh, throughout the state. And for, um, the thing that I, I find most people saying is that because I have personal experience with it, um, they trust it. So, um, you know, like going to a professor, uh, if he's never actually used the TIR training, he can only be uh, teaching robotically. But once you've had the experience um, that you have, Cynthia, it's uh, much more meaningful. I did promise you all in that initial email, I think I said, P.S., you're going to have a blast. Would you yeah. speak to that? Just tell me if I held up my end of the bargain. She did. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. We laughed uh, uh, exponentially more times than... Well, I haven't cried yet, so. <laughs> well, we still but got I time. I laughed a lot. We still got time. Yes, you laughed a lot. But there is a, a truth in your your uh, presentation, in your um, your grasp, which is it's a delight. Good, thank you. I think also the the beauty part of this, and I do have a master's degree in social work, but I I don't. The social work model is the medical model even though it's social work. You need a diagnosis, you have to find something wrong with the person in order to provide treatment and to do a treatment plan. This is exactly the opposite in, in many respects because you don't have to find that anything is wrong with the person. They may have some baggage that they would like to have a lot lighter, but there's nothing wrong with them. And so you're coming at it from a much more positive direction and it gives better results. There are a lot of people who have been in therapy a very long time who have significant issues, especially with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, be it war veterans or kids who have been in foster care or, or people from troubled parts of inner cities or whatever. Um, that's really hard to treat in traditional therapy. And this has a much higher success rate. And it's an evidence-based practice. So there is proof that this works. And with we're almost in the, the facilitator is, is almost in the role of a coach. 
and we're just coaching on the sidelines, but they're doing all the work. And we're not in a position to give advice. We're just being present and coaching people through the process. And it's successful. And I think that diagnoses in the medical field, in the psychological field, can be detrimental. It can, and we're giving my own experience. We're giving diagnoses to very young children. They even have a set of diagnoses for children under the age of three. This is something that follows them all the way through school. It can follow them into college and into their adult lives. Is it, are we really helping people with that? I'm not convinced necessarily. Because we're not making them better necessarily. Good. Do you have any more burning questions that you wanted to ask and or does anyone have anything burning that they want to say because we really do need to wrap up? Well, I'm all set. Okay, good. Anyone have anything more that they need to ask or say before Stu leaves? No. Okay, Not great. Me. Thank you all so much, Stu and Nelson and all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's take a quick break and then we're going to be just doing one or two quick things and then we're off in session again at 2.